I'm a Lego maniac. You might remember those old commercials from the 80s or 90s. Lego maniac. I can't help it. I've been playing with these Danish plastic blocks for as long as I can remember. I collect all sorts of Lego sets. Everything from classic Legoland space to the Lego movie. I've got complete sets of 16 for every series of minifigures, plus two Mr. Gold minifigures that I ordered off of eBay for $9,999.98 each. My basement is occupied with tables and shelves adorned with models to the point where it's impossible to walk around without bumping into something. I subscribed to Brick Kicks back in 1987, and after that one out of print, followed up with Lego Mania, Lego Magazine, Brick Master Magazine, and now Lego Club Magazine, plus issues of Lego Adventures and World Club Magazine that I imported from Europe. I've still got every Lego t-shirt from the 90s, even though none of them fit me now, including one awesome shirt that I got with some UFO Land Rover for only $5.99. My wallet is so thin since crack is cheaper, but I'm always the first to check to see if the local Lego store has received the latest shipments of Ultimate Collector Series Star Wars sets. Some may say that, at the ripe age of 38, my life is a wreck. But that's the life of the Lego maniac. Uh, but let's talk about video games. No, let's not talk about Lego. But let's talk about Lego video games. When Lego Island first came out back in 1997, my mind was blown. It was totally awesome, dude. And it was the 90s, which meant you could say totally awesome, dude, in public without people staring at you. Ever since then, I've collected every single Lego game, plus any re-releases. This even includes titles like Galador and Bionicle the Game, which are total garbage. But I still play them anyway because they're Lego. Even though TT Games' latest title, the Lego Movie Video Game, is just another version of Lego Star Wars without any of the novelty or fun of the first 500 versions of Lego Star Wars that they've released in the past two years, I still love it. Because I'm that much of a Lego maniac. But, uh, sadly, there is one Lego game that I thought I would never be able to enjoy again. Lego Universe. Ah, that is, until one fateful day this past winter. I was playing the Lego Movie video game on the PC, checking out a cool cheat code that unlocks Johnny Thunder, wondering why he simply wasn't available from the start, because clearly everyone would want to play as him. So it is a mystery why you can't play as him unless you know a cheat code. It was about 1.53 in the afternoon, and I heard my grandmother screaming at me, Zack the real man arrived two hours ago. Stop playing that video game and make yourself useful, young man. Fine, Grandma. I yelled back at her, disheveled. And I paused the game and went outside to collect the mail. As I brought it inside the house and put it down on the kitchen table, I was expecting to find another unemployment show. Instead, much to my surprise, I found a CD case and a note. Even though it was written very messily, as though its writer was in a hurry, I immediately recognized the handwriting on the note as belonging to my old friend and former fellow Lego maniac, Jack. Zack, I've had enough of this. I can't handle it anymore. It's too much for me. I had to get rid of this somehow. But instead of destroying it myself or just selling it on eBay, I thought giving it to you was a much better option. Please don't make me regret this decision by doing something stupid that would end up being written about in some lame, overly cliched, creepy pasta. Please, Zach, you have to destroy this disc because I cannot for some poorly explained reasons. It's the only way. Do not play it. Please, for the love of all that is holy, whatever you do, do not play it. I trust you as a friend, Zach. Please don't make me feel that my trust has been misplaced by going against what I'm telling you. Do not play it. Do not even think about playing it. Do not even think about not playing it. You cannot let yourself be tempted, even though it's the only fully functional copy of LEGO Universe that still works offline. Oh, wow. 
a fully functional copy of Lego Universe that still works offline? Everything else didn't matter as soon as I read those words. Finally, I was about to play Lego Universe again. It was the Lego Maniac's dream come true. With that, I tossed aside the note and looked at the CD. It was blank and plain in appearance, though the words Bob.exe were scrawled on it. Black permanent marker. I immediately recall that Bob was the name of Lego Universe's mascot, and that reminded me of how excited I was to play this game. I rushed back to my computer and immediately exited out of the Lego movie video game, and in my haste, I even forgot to save. Not that it mattered, anyway. I took out the disc for the Lego movie video game and threw in the CD for Bob.exe so quickly that I nearly shattered it to pieces in my excitement. This opened the LEGO Universe patcher and started downloading some new files before saying it was ready to play. I launched the game and it brought me to the main menu. Everything was just as I remembered it. Music by Brian Taylor. Funny little animations with the Nexus astronaut and dragon in the background. Oh, and of course, Bob himself standing cheerily next to the login menu to welcome me back to this friendly universe. I typed in my LEGO.com username and password and clicked the blue arrow to continue. The connecting to authentication message popped up. And then, for approximately 0 0.51 seconds, the game flashed something very different. Something that I'm somehow able to remember perfectly in the instant it appeared. The LEGO Universe logo no longer looked polished, but now rusted. The white bubbly clouds had vanished, and the blue gradient sky had turned red. The blue trees on the horizon turned black. It looked like they'd been burned. I've bared to the black and bark. The Nexus astronaut was lying on the floor. It was no longer white, but now resembled the scorched earth of a volcano. And the dragon stood over him with vicious intent. Down on the bottom of the screen, where it normally says, Copyright 2011, the Lego Group, the year was replaced with 666, and there was blood, hyper-realistic blood, blood on the logo, blood on the trees, blood on the Nexus astronaut, blood on the floor, blood dripping from the dragon's maw, blood on the blood, blood. The worst of all was Bob. He looked fairly normal, staring at me with a perpetual smile. There was something horribly wrong about his normally comforting smile. And there was blood dripping from his empty black eyes. But as I said, this was only approximately 0 0.51 seconds, so it didn't bother me. I just thought I imagined it. My therapist often tells me that I imagine things. He just doesn't understand. All I need to do is just imagine. After that, it stayed on the connecting to authentication screen for about 10.3 seconds before moving on to the character select screen. To my surprise, none of the four characters displayed were my characters prior to LEGO Universe's closure. Instead, they were NPCs from the game, but not just any NPCs. They were Hail, Storm, Vanda Darkflame, Duke's Exeter, and Dr. Overbuild. In my excitement, I did not notice right away that a few things were actually quite wrong. In the background, there was normally a bunch of blue-tinted stick figures playing around. Oh, here they were red-tinted instead. It appeared to be missing their heads. Well, there was probably some blood, too. The background music sounded like it was 50% slower and in reverse for it. some reason. I could swear that some parts of the reverse song almost sounded like the ticking of a clock. But I was sure that this wasn't some bulk of anything. I wasn't worried. So what if there were a few graphical and auditory glitches? I was going to play Lego Universe again. I was going to play as Hailstorm and the other faction leaders. Without hesitation, I selected Hailstorm and pressed the blue arrow to continue. Or rather, I would have pressed the blue arrow, but for some reason it was red. When I clicked it, I could have sworn that I heard high-pitched laughter in the background, sounding almost like an echoing version of Bob's laughter. The screen went black for a loose estimate of 9.896 seconds. Then the loading screen popped up and said that my destination was the Venture Explorer. Now, this was the first game I thought, you know, something was odd. You know, never before have I had these problems, but not only was this the first game, but this was the first time. Was Hellstorm's save file really only on the tutorial level of the game? I also noticed that the Venture Explorer's artwork depicted the spaceship looking even more wrecked than I remembered it. 
I had to assume that this was one of those new files that it downloaded. Probably some cool hyper-realistic graphics update that was never released thanks to LEGO Universe's cancellation. When Hailstorm spawned on the Venture Explorer, the first thing I noticed was that the Venture Explorer's interior was also considerably more wrecked than I remembered it. The entire pieces of the walkway chewed up into pieces. The nearby pods of sleeping minifigures and suspended animation were cracked open, but the minifigures inside remained lifeless. At first, Jet Moonshot was nowhere to be seen, but then I found his body smashing to pieces in a pool of blood. There were more suspicious pools of blood coating the entire world. I wasn't sure what the music was, but like before, it sounded like it was played in reverse at 50% speed. I made my way to the Venture Explorer bridge where Bob was waiting for me. Like before, his face was locked in a perpetual grin with blood dripping from his eyes. He popped one arm out of its socket to wave it at me, which I remembered being a cute little animation in the vein of Lego Island. But now, when Bob popped his arm out, a fountain of blood erupted from his open socket in a manner reminiscent of the Black Knight from Monty Python. <laughs> the game indicated that Bob had a mission for me. I interacted with him to accept it. His dialogue was simply, Hey, kid, do you want to use your imagination? Mm -hmm. I don't remember this dialogue from the game, but I shrugged it off. Why should I be afraid? It was only a video game. Right. The mission was to collect six imagination orbs from around the nearby pistons, just like I remembered it. Just like the six golden coins from Super Mario Land 2. Despite the horribly wrecked status of the ship, the pistons were still functional. I was able to grab five of the orbs with ease. However, upon grabbing the sixth orb, Bob's face started flashing on the screen. The game started lagging horribly as the frame rate took a nosedive. This caused me to miss a jump, and Hailstorm promptly fell into the wiring of the ship, where he was horrifically electrocuted. I was saving. That's cheap, I yelled at the computer. I died because of lag. The smashed pop-up appeared, but it was different. Instead of Bob, it depicted Hailstorm with gratuitous amounts of blood pouring out of his mutilated body. The word smash was replaced with dead. But worst of all, the rebuild option was not available. This especially irritated me because I thought that the game was glitched and I'd have to restart in order to close the pop-up. Which I already had to do enough times in beta testing and wasn't particularly eager to relive those memories. Fortunately, after about 7.4259 seconds, the screen cut to black with Bob's laugh echoing in the background. Then, approximately 10.2651 seconds later, the game returned to the character select screen. Hailstorm's minifigure was desaturated with color. He no longer had his usual cocky expression, but now looked depressed. There was blood dripping from his eyes, just like Bob. Most importantly, he could not be selected as a player character. <sighs> I tried for several minutes, but failed. So I decided to try another character, Vanda Darkflame. Again, as I clicked the red arrow to continue, Bob's laugh was heard as the screen cut to black for a rough estimate of 9.953726 seconds. When the loading screen popped up, this time my destination was Avent Gardens. Vanda Darkflame spawned near the wrecked Paradox Research Facility. Dark and sinister music was playing, once again in reverse and at 50% speed. Avant the gardens was not as I remembered it. The trees were bare and dead, and the grass was burned away to reveal scorched earth beneath. There were no birds singing, and the ground was littered with skeletons wearing pink pants lying in pools of blood. I went to find Wisp Lee, expecting that he'd give me a mission to find Epsilon Starcracker. So Wisp Lee was covered in bandages. Or rather, more bandages than usual. He was wrapped in bandages from head to toe like a mummy. The bandages also looked like they were stained with blood. Wisp Lee did not offer a mission, but a dialogue bubble appeared over his head saying, Move! 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 I guess being covered with bandages would do that to you. I ran to the Sentinel outpost, expecting to find Epsilon Starcracker. Instead, I found Bob again, grinning with blood, dripping out of his eyes, as was now becoming the norm. He had a mission accompanied by the dialogue, calling for help from Sentinel. They won't help you. 
What a paradox, isn't it? Eh, this made no sense, so I just ignored it. The mission was to build a satellite beacon to call in a Sentinel flight airstrike. Found one of the quick builds fairly quickly and assembled it. The satellite beacon made an unusual sound. It sounded like an 8-bit version of Bob's laugh. Moments later, I heard the familiar sound of Sentinel flight zooming overhead. However, instead of aiming for the nearby Stromlings and Stromling mech, Sentinel flight bombed Vanna Darkflame instead. She screamed as she was consumed in the explosion. When the dust settled, there was nothing but a pool of blood where she once stood. Bob's face flashed on screen for nearly 0 0.3141592 six seconds when this happened. Oh, come on, I grumbled. You don't expect me to buy that. The smash pop-up appeared, looking just as it did before with dead text and lots of blood. However, this time it was Vanda Darkflame depicted in the pop-up instead of Hailstorm. Just as before, there was no option to rebuild. And I had to wait roughly 6.73859372 seconds before the screen cut to black with Bob's laugh echoing in the background. About 10.29485715 seconds later, I was back at the character select screen. Like Hale, Vanda Darkflame's minifigure was desaturated, depressed, and crying blood. She wasn't playable anymore either, so I moved on to the next character. Duke Exeter. I clicked on the red arrow to continue. Bob laughed. The screen cut to black for nearly 10.04867397 seconds. The loading screen indicated that I was going back to Avant Gardens. This time, Duke Exeter spawned in the Sentinel base camp. The background music sounded like it might have been calm and relaxing if it was played normally, but instead sounded ominous and foreboding due to being slowed down and played in reverse like the other songs. Most of the Sentinel faction members were dismembered and lying in pools of blood, which caked the ground and walls of the camp. Deciding that I didn't want to remain in the Sentinel base camp, I made my way for the tunnel to the assembly monument. However, the jump pad required to pass the Sentinel Tuntel Sentinel indicated that I needed Theo Balfour's permission in order to use it. Seeing as Theo Balfour was lying decapitated in a pool of blood and probably wasn't enough for much conversation, I guessed it was stuck in the Sentinel Tunnel Sentinel Base Camp for now. Turning around, I noticed that Bob, blood and all, was standing in Beck's strong arts place. Once again, he had a mission for me. I was getting rather tired of this pattern. Since I had nothing better to do, I grudgingly accepted. His mission dialogue was simply, You cannot survive forever, you know. Yeah, no shit. The mission was to survive 5 minutes and 76 seconds in the Avant Garden survival instance. Sadly, no real challenge to me, who previously held the Storm Universe record for surviving 78 hours, 35 minutes, and 25 seconds with nothing more than a few boxes of pizza, a carton of chocolate milk, and an adult undergarment thing. I started the survival instance, and Duke Exeter spawned in the battlefield. However, upon initiation, Bob's face flashed on screen for about 0 0.93786935938 seconds. <laughs> And then suddenly, Duke was instantly overwhelmed by an impossibly large horde of dark spiderlings that killed him in the blink of an eye. Hey, no fair, I yelled at the computer screen. That's clearly hacking. The altered smash screen popped up again, this time starring Duke's Exeter. It was really starting to lose its novelty and became more of an annoyance than anything. Screen cut to black with Bob's laugh echoing in the background, which was seriously starting to grate on my nerves. Fuck! I heard my grandmother yell from the other room. Take a break from that video game. It's time for your nap. Oh, come on, Grandma. I shouted back. I'm 38 years old. I don't need a nap. Young man, she scolded. So long as you live under my roof, you live under my rules. And it's time for your nap. Knowing it wasn't worth arguing, since I always lose arguments against my grandmother anyways, I grumbled to myself. I shut down Bob.exe, got up from my computer, walked two feet to the couch, and laid down upon it. I 
I stood in the void, freezing cold and pitch black. At first there was deafening silence, but then I heard voices crying out in terror. I turned and was startled to see Hail, Storm, Vanda, Dark Flame, and Duke Exeter standing before me. They were all drained of color, save for the bright red blood gushing from their empty black eyes. They reached out for me, wailing in pain and agony, and I was powerless to help them. And then I heard an old, too familiar laugh. I turned around slowly to see Bob. He grinned sadistically, his empty eyes boring to my soul as hyper-realistic blood streamed down his face. He spoke with a voice that sounded like the grinding of bone. Obviously, how much fun it is to use your imagination. I was too terrified to reply. I couldn't even run. Yes, Zack. You're at my mercy now. It won't be long now before. Wait, what? I noticed that Bob was confused about something, so I turned around and, much to my surprise, saw Leonardo DiCaprio and Joseph Gordon-Levitt. DiCaprio raised his hands in a defensive manner. Don't mind us, he insisted. We're not really here. I promise we're not trying to perform an inception or anything like that. We're just ordinary projections of your subconscious. Just carry on, pretend we don't exist. Excuse me, growled Bob. I'm trying to be super creepy right now. You guys are ruining the spooky atmosphere. But it was too late. I realized that Bob had no power over me. It was all just a dream. And when you know you're dreaming, you can take the dream in any direction you want. What dream? With a sly chuckle, I snapped my fingers, and Bob turned into a potato. I then took off in flight like Superman and went on all sorts of zany psychedelic dream adventures full of pink elephants and shape-shifting dragons and utterly unconventional ruler who believed a literal blind justice. A cult of people who were accidentally worshipping you and a kitty, a bunch of ghosts arguing over <laughs> if they were calling it. Some mischievous gremlins who were backing up the sewage pipes in a Lego store that had every single Lego set, including those that don't even exist but always smelled musty for some reason. Everything was awesome. And off in some corner of the dreamscape, a lonely potato yelled. I woke up from my nap several hours later. Wow, I thought aloud. Life is pointless. Then, like nothing ever happened, I got off the couch, returned to the computer, and continued playing Bob.exe. Just like you appeared in my dream, Duke Exeter was depressed, the saturated clang. He was no longer playable either. I could tell that there was a predictable pattern forming, but since I was bored and had nothing better to do, I decided to select the final playable character, Dr. Overbuild. As I expected, clicking the red arrow caused Bob to laugh, and the screen was cut to black for about 9.790358349617 seconds. Once again, the destination was out on guards. Dr. Overbuild spawned at the base of Assembly Monument. The monument appeared to be on the verge of collapse and did not look very well maintained compared to its normal appearance. It was also covered with dead birds and blood. Rusty steel was hardly maimed, lying in a pool of blood. But by this point, I was so used to seeing this sort of imagery that I was completely desensitized. The background music was played at 50% speed and in reverse, which by now was nothing new. Essentially, anything that might have been mildly unnerving in the first five minutes was now just boring and rehashed formula. No shit. As I expected, it was Bob who stood where Rusty normally would stand, offering a mission. This time, although Bob was still grinning and still had blood dripping from his eyes, his demeanor seemed a little angrier than before. I guess he wanted revenge for being turned into a potato in my dream. When I interacted with him, his mission text simply said, You cannot beat me. The mission was to ascend the monument and reach the finish line. Based on his dialogue, I half expected that he would race me. But even after accepting the mission, Bob just stood idly in place, so I left him behind at the starting line. From experience, I knew that the yellow path is the fastest, so I took that. Gotta go fast. Unfortunately, the game started lagging, causing me to fall through the elevator quick build several times, which was really annoying, but at least it didn't lead to an instant kill like it did for Hail Storm. On my fourth try, I managed to ride the elevator without falling through and used the jump pad to bounce to the monument finish line. Well, at first, the finish line was unoccupied. I thought I might actually complete this mission for once. 
with less than 0.49386739571237 one, two, three seconds before I reach the finish line. Bob's face flashed on screen again. In that instant, he transported to the finish line. Dr. Overbuild was too slow and lost the race. As a consequence for his failure, Overbuild was smashed and his pieces fell to the floor in a pool of blood. I was perplexed. Oh, really? Overbuild dies because he lost the race? That has to be the lamest and cheapest death so far. The altered smash pop-up with appeared as expected. Dr. Overbuild was the unfortunate subject depicted as expected. String cut the black as expected for, I don't know, whatever, so uh, seconds. Okay, can we just get this over with? Oh, if only. I grumbled, tired of the pattern by this point. Were there no more surprises? Just rehashing the same tricks over and 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 over Then, after a loose estimate of, let's say, 50.314928693042 seconds, the screen changed to a most unpleasant image. The image showed a hyper-realistic version of Bob standing in the void of the maelstrom. It was so hyper-realistic, you could make out every wrinkle on his yellow skin and every crease in the fold on his red shirt. On the proportions of the Lego minifigure, this hyper-realism fell straight into the territory of Uncanny Valley. Like your mom. And its face... His wide, empty, pitch-black, hyper-realistic eyes with hyper-realistic blood gushing from them were staring right at me, right through the fourth wall of the game. He grinned like a hyper-realistic, psychotic murderer, with the edges of his hyper-realistic lips stretching past his hyper-realistic skull and revealing crooked hyper-realistic teeth resting in a hyper-realistic void of black emptiness. His hyper-realistic teeth were freshly kicked with hyper-realistic blood. I could do nothing but stare at this gruesome image for approximately 30.28593857193857 seconds. Then, as Bob's laugh echoed in the background, horrible and demonic text appeared superimposed on this image. I am Bob. Me? I was too shocked to speak and simply stared at this message in horror. Only now did I realize... What a complete and utter waste of time this was. As soon as I found my voice, I made sure Bob knew it. Really? Really? You are Bob? Gee, I would have never have guessed. Thanks, Captain Obvious. You saved the day. What was the point of this? I just wasted all this time and said there are the blood. Just so Bob could go on a quest for self-discovery? Maybe you should have said, I am blood instead. Now that would have made more sense given this game's obsession with blood. Man, this was stupid. What was I thinking? What a load of mega bullocks. That's it. I've had it. I'm going to smash the CD into pieces so that you can change the message to, I am dead. Now that wouldn't be a big surprise either. I was kicked back to the character's live stream by the time I was finished ranting. I could have sworn that Bob's expression turned rather disgruntled just before the screen change. Dr. Overbuild now joined the other Nexus Force faction leaders and being the satyr and crying blood. But I thought that, this time, uh, they looked more mildly annoyed rather than depressed. And so they, too, were incredulous of the utter stupidity of this game. Then it turned out that I didn't need to shut the game off myself because my computer spontaneously shut off on its own. I couldn't turn it back on, so I started muttering curses under my breath because now I'm pretty sure that this game was so bad that it broke my computer. I turned around and pulled out my cell phone to call the local computer repair shop or perhaps the police. Then I heard a voice right behind me, barely louder than a whisper. Just imagine. I turned around again to see where the voice came from and what I saw sitting on my computer desk, staring right at me, 
Well, you might have thought it would be John Lennon, but no, it was a Bob minifigure smiling with blood under its eyes. Mm, I'm just imagining how much money I could make by auctioning it off of eBay. Hmm. Vomit very cookie, vomit very cookie, vomit very cookie, vomit very cookie.